Okay, welcome to another great night. We're very excited uh, to have Tim and Mo with us from the Other Side Academy, and Brian Lamson will introduce them in just a minute. But let's talk about last week. Uh, how did you like Brady Murray? Good? Okay. So, <clears throat> tonight we have three of these fabulous journals from Danique that say dare mighty things on them. So the first three people that come up, tell us one thing that you learned from Brady Murray. Okay, there's number one, number two, number three. Come on up and give us your name. And you get one of these journals. So one thing you're going to take with you and remember throughout your career that Brady Murray taught you. Your name? My name is Eric. And from the last week's uh, talk, I remember that he said that all of us are entrusted with a huge amount of resources and time. And we are going to be held responsible for how we use that time in the future in front of ourselves. So use it wisely. Great. There you go. Okay. Hey, come on. So how are you doing? What's your name? Deonza Atkinson. Okay, what did you learn from Brady? Well, first of all, I was so impressed with the humility he had in his demeanor. And just his main message of if we get caught up in a cause, miracles will happen. Great. Thank you. There you go. Okay, number three. So tell us your name and what he taught you. My name is Colin Peterson, and I learned that a lot of things about time management, especially about getting up earlier in the morning to read and to study, as well as you can always make time for the things that are most important in your life. So are you now getting up at 4.55 to beat him by one minute? I got up at 10 this morning, but I'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, Brian, where's Brian? Brian will introduce our speakers. All right, we're in for a fantastic night tonight. We have Tim Stay here um, from the Other Side Academy, as well as Mo Egan. And the Other Side Academy is a school uh, where their model is learn by doing. So they have uh, close to 100 students, and they have businesses like a moving company and a food truck. And... Uh, uh, lawn care and a thrift boutique and uh, my wife and I we actually moved four times in the last six years we moved to Logan a year and a half ago and we actually called the other side movers and it was the best moving experience we ever had next time you're in Salt Lake check out their thrift boutique uh, you can find awesome clothes like this suede jacket that I got there over the Christmas break and you can support a good cause um, so Tim Stay he is the CEO of the Other Side Academy. He's led, uh, founded, and sold many businesses, uh, tech companies. He's a leading entrepreneurship, entrepreneur in Utah. And he has a master's as well as his MBA from BYU. And uh, let's see, he has been leading the Other Side Academy uh, for, for a few years now. And uh, it's just a great, uh, great example, great story he's going to share with us tonight. Uh, we'd also like to uh, recognize his wife, Delita. Uh, they're here on, on Valentine's, no less. Um, so, uh, let's see, Mo Egan, he grew up in California, and he was a star athlete, uh, had a, a great job, had uh, promising relationships, and they were all destroyed by drugs. He found the, the Delancey Street organization where he changed his life around after a couple of years and he, he ended up staying there for two more years because he loved it so much. Uh, after that he led a touring company in San Francisco and worked his way up to, to leading their operations in Las Vegas and he joined the Other Side Academy uh, just in fall of 2016. So please join me in welcoming Tim Stay and Mo Egan. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name's Tim. And I'm O. And uh, we're with the Other Side Academy. We appreciate this opportunity to be here. And, and happy Valentine's Day. Uh, this is probably not what you had planned for, but we appreciate you <laughs> being here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about Mo's journey and the process of change. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the Other Side Academy and specifics about that. And then we'll leave some time for questions. All right. Thanks. Uh, 
So I had fallen asleep uh, standing up in the middle of a street in San Francisco. I was coming off a one week cocaine and alcohol binge and I hadn't slept the entire time. Horns were blowing and cars were swerving to try and miss me. A friend of mine saw me standing up in the middle of the street asleep and came over and grabbed me by the shoulders and said, hey, what's going on? This is not you. You need to get some help. I was homeless and to continue my habit of drinking and drugging, I was committing crimes and getting arrested. I'd lost my job, my daughter, and all of those around me that loved and cared about me. See, I didn't know how to get help. For me, help was covering up my emotions and my difficulties with sex, drugs, and alcohol. That was the only help I knew. I didn't know how to get real help. Within weeks of this incident, I was arrested again for the seventh time. Wasted human potential. That was Mo, but Mo isn't alone. In the United States, there's over 600,000 who are homeless. 23.5 million Americans are addicted to drugs and alcohol. And on any given day, there are 2.3 million Americans incarcerated, giving this country the dubious distinction of having the highest incarceration rate in the world. Yay! I don't think that's something we need to be proud of. Some people need to be in jail. Some need, need to be locked up. But many who are in jail and locked up don't know how to change. They go get out, they get in trouble, they go back, they learn new stuff, they become worse criminals. Many who are locked up don't know how to change. Imagine getting high when you're just a kid and no one telling you that it was wrong. How do you figure out life and how to manage it when you're getting high in elementary school? Yeah. So I grew up in East Oakland, California. I was the youngest of uh, seven children. I had a brother who thought he was a pimp, a brother who was an alcoholic, and a sister at that time gave birth to twins that were born addicted to crack cocaine. I had cousins that regularly used and sold drugs around the house. I remember one day at elementary school, I got caught selling marijuana joints. And I was sent to the office and then sent home. When I got home and I walked to the door, nobody said anything. There was no consequences. And I learned at a very early age that I could do whatever I wanted to do and that nobody cared about me or what I did. So we moved from East Oakland to Santa Rosa, California. And in high school, I progressed to cocaine and speed. I would drink on the weekends. I was playing three different sports and somehow getting away with it. In fact, we were having some success. We won a couple championships and I got MVP of a couple sports. Now while the madness played out, I was inducted into our high school sports hall of fame. I played football in college and uh, you know I did well until I had a football injury and I had to have surgery. And after my surgery, I was prescribed pain pills. But long after the pain was gone, I continued taking those pain pills, adding that to the drugs and alcohol. And I didn't like the way that my life was going. So I said, okay, I'll move to Atlanta, Georgia. Maybe if I move and do a geographical, I would change. But I brought me with me. When I moved to Atlanta, my new job was at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I loved working for Coretta Scott King. But my drugs and alcohol, it persisted. I remember sitting in my office and looking outside my window and there was Dr. King's eternal flame. And I thought to myself, come on, dude. You gotta get it together. You're in a great place and you're part of history right now. Now that lasted for a little while but not for long. 
my drug use, it continued and it got worse. And I eventually quit knowing that I would get fired to avoid the shame and the embarrassment. So Mo falls asleep in the middle of Market Street in San Francisco. A few weeks later, he's arrested for the seventh time. As a society, what do we do with Mo Egan? Should we, let's say we lock him up, this time for a really long time, and then after 10 years and a half a million dollars of taxpayer money, he gets out. What do you think will happen to Mo? Well, statistics say that 67% of the people that we let out of prison reoffend within three years. That's not a great track record. After spending all that money to lock him up for a long time and waste, wasting his life, what should we do? Maybe we'll send him to a program. Trouble is, Mo had already gone to a number of programs and they hadn't helped. So what do we do? How do we help people caught in this destructive cycle? Now for the really great news. There is a solution for Mo and for the tens of thousands like him who are struggling and battling this, this fight. Over 50 years ago, a model for transformational behavioral change was dealt, developed not by doctors, not by therapists, but by addicts themselves. Mo was allowed to go to such a place that embraced this model called Delancey Street in California, in San Francisco. They don't take any government money. They don't, and there's no charge to the participants. The convicts and addicts that go there run businesses that generate the money to run the place through vocational training schools. We've adopted that same model. Here's Mo at Delancey Street while he was there. We've adopted that same model at a place called the Other Side Academy in Salt Lake City. We've been able to established here, we're now a little over two years old, and we hope to scale this across the United States. In this model, we don't focus on the addiction or the crime. We are not a drug treatment program. We're a life skills school that focuses on the underlying behavior that led to these problems. We teach things that Mo never learned growing up in his East Oakland home. To live lives of integrity, accountability, and responsibility, and love for others. And we do it without doctors or therapists or social workers. The Other Side Academy is completely run and operated by former addicts and convicts. Delancey Street and the Other Side Academy are run on a few simple ideas. First, you have to want to change. That's right. So when I got arrested on my last run in San Francisco, running around the streets, and I finally get arrested on my last run, the arresting officer was my old college football coach turned cop. I felt embarrassed, couldn't even look at him. But I remember him saying to me that once you start this life of in and out, of jail and prison, it's not going to stop unless you do something about it. There's nothing gonna be, uh, nothing's going to change. And that hit me kind of hard. I had some spurts of, uh, of being successful in life uh, here and there. And I knew that there was something better for me. I don't think God intended for me to be walking the streets or dead or wind up a dope fiend alcoholic. Yeah. And so I heard about this place called Delancey Street. And when I was in jail facing some new charges, I wrote a letter to Delancey Street pleading for them to help me. And they sent somebody to interview me. And by the grace of God, I was accepted into Delancey Street. The next principle of change we call act as if. This is really important. It means that even if you don't feel like being a decent human being, or honest or loving, you act that way until you become that person. We practice being a moral person 
over and over, day after day, until it's who we become. Yeah, that's an important concept of what we do. Now, when I first got to Delancey Street, one of the leaders in the community told me, he says, Mo, you know we act as if here. He said, you know the kind of person that you want to be. You want to have some integrity, you want to be honest, and you want to be truthful. He said, let's face it, you're none of those. And the only way that you're going to become that person is if you practice being him for a really long time. And I took that to heart. So soon after I was there, at the Lancet Street, maybe a couple months, they decided to trust me to go out with the moving company. And I remember going to this house in North San Francisco. It was actually Sausalito, beautiful house overlooking the bay, four stories, elevator inside. And as we were packing things up, my criminal mind just went into action. Take the purse, grab the guns, grab the bike, and run to the dope spot and trade those for more drugs. But I remember what one of the leaders in the community said, act as if, even though you don't feel like doing it, do it anyway. And that stuck with me. And I had a feeling that I hadn't had in a long time. I felt what it was like to have some integrity, to be honest, and to be decent. I stayed on that move. And when I got back to Delancey Street, I told on myself. I went to one of the leaders in the community and I said, hey, this is what I was thinking about doing. And that felt good, and it stuck with me. The next principle of change we call each one teach one. We believe that when A helps B, A gets better. In other words, the way you save your life is by helping save someone else's. So when I got to Delancey Street, my conversation was very limited. Soon after I arrived, there was about 85 other men and women that had just gotten there just like I did. And the only thing I can talk about was the streets, the drugs, the crimes, the women. That's what my conversation was up to that point. And I remember one of the leaders came up to me and said, hey, did you came here to change? Or do you want to continue being that loser before you came here? And I said, no, I want to change. He said, great, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back out there, get back in there, find somebody else that's telling those loser stories and tell them to knock it off. And that was something different for me. It means that I'm now responsible for trying to help somebody else in the house get their life together as well. And that felt good. The next principle is peer accountability. When you're accepted to the Other Side Academy, you give your peers the power to hold you accountable and to be brutally honest with you when you mess up, which we know you will do. So there was a day I had broke some rules. Well, actually, I broke a few rules while I was there at Delancey Street. And later on in a meeting that we call games, which is an opportunity to get feedback from your peers from something that you had done wrong. And I remember being in that game, and one of my peers said to me, Mo, you're a liar, you're a sneak, you're a cheat, and you're a manipulative person. And I looked at him, I said, not me, he couldn't be talking about me, when really it was spot on. And then another person said it. And then another person came with some specific examples of that behavior. And about the fifth person into it, I felt something give. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. That's exactly who I am. And that's the person that I wanted to change. It got to where even though going to the games was hurtful emotionally because they were telling me the truth about myself, I looked forward to going to games so that I can have my destructive behavior and my flaws brought to me by people who loved and cared enough about me to tell me the truth. And now I feel sorry for anybody that doesn't have people like that in their lives. Games became a game changer for me. 
The next principle of change is immediate consequences for your bad behavior. So at the other side of Academy, we have people living in the same dorm with those from former gang rivals. And there's never any violence. Never. And you'd be surprised at how little it takes to make that happen. One day I broke some rules. Like I said, I broke a few rules. I was given a haircut, a verbal reprimand by one of the leaders in the community. That's what happened, huh? That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> she gave me some extra chores, some extra dishes. Now you might think that's crazy. You got a house full of felons and the punishment that you give is extra dishes. But it works. When she gave me that haircut, the first thing I felt was, because it was in a room like this, it was a dining room, there was, I was the 474th person that was admitted to uh, Delancey Street when I got there. And so we're in the dining room when I got this haircut, and it was in front of about 200 people. And it was totally silent. And I remember after she gave me that haircut, I felt embarrassed, I felt ashamed, I wanted to split and run and go get high to cover up those emotions. But I said, you know what? It's just some dishes, some extra chores, an opportunity to look at what I did wrong. The thing with the dishes is that while you're on dishes, doing dishes and those extra chores, all your peers come up and say, why are you on dishes? Why are you on dishes? And you have to explain every single time. And by the time I'm done with those dishes, I think long and hard about making the same mistake twice. The last principle is that you have to practice doing the right thing for a really, really long time until you become that person. I had been to other programs, but at the end of two weeks, or six months, or whenever that funding ran out, I still hadn't changed. And I remember those programs, being there and graduating at two weeks and six months, and getting a certificate and saying to myself, I am not ready. I know for sure that I'm gonna go fall on my face again. But at the other side academy, we don't talk about being good, we practice being good. And the good thing about the vocational training schools is you can practice being good on our moving company, on our food truck, at the other side thrift boutique. And throughout the day, and this is how it works, throughout the day, that real person comes out, that nasty attitude, that sneaky person, that manipulative person, it comes out during the day. And our peers are able to say, hey, you know what? We're gonna call you on it. And then you go back and you try it again and again and again until you get it right. Now it's a two year program, but if at the end of two years you don't have it, you don't feel it in your gut and you're not ready to go, you can humbly ask to stay longer. It wasn't until my third year in Delancey Street that I felt it in my gut because I was honest with myself. And just like the other side academy, at Delancey Street, you go up for a commitment at around 18 months. You go into a room, what we call a Vatican or a quorum, and you say to the staff, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna get a job, and I'm gonna leave. Or you ask to stay. Now this is a situation that was a game changer for me because the first time I was honest with myself. At 18 months, this is what I was thinking. I was thinking if I put a smaller piece of drug on the pipe or if I go to the bar and only drink wine, I'll be okay. Yeah, I'm okay, I'm fine. That's a lie I had told to myself over and over again. But finally I said, you know what, I'm gonna be honest. May I please stay an extra two more years? And that's exactly what I did. I graduated. In 2011, became a trusted manager in a company, bought my own home, and in October of 2016, I got a call from the other side academy asking me 
if I wanted to come help run the place? I said, absolutely. So now I know what it feels like to help another person and have them get better as, as a result. And that feeling sticks with me, and I get to have it every day. You can't buy it, you can't smoke it, you can't drink it, and you can't snort it. Again, I ask that question, what as a society should we do with someone like Mo Egan, who was arrested for the seventh time? He was given this chance to go to a place where he can undergo this transformational change, rejoin society, become a gain a great job, buy his own home, and now he's helping save lives. Isn't this a much better place for Mo than being in prison, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. So now I get the opportunity, just the same as my buddy came up to me when I was standing in the middle of the street, sleep. I get to grab people by the shoulders and say, hey, this is not you. You're better than that, you're bigger than this. You need, to get to, you need to get some help. We're going to um, uh, now talk a little bit about the specifics of the Other Side Academy. And this is one of our students, Diego. And he was running with a gang in Salt Lake and got arrested and came and joined us. He today is one of our crew bosses on our moving company. And he's left that lifestyle behind. I want to talk about what we've accomplished in the almost two and a half years since we've been open. Um, first, so you get an idea of who it is that's at the Other Side Academy, let's talk about our students. Our students have been arrested on average 25 times. They weren't getting better by being arrested another time. One student had been arrested by over 98 times. He wasn't getting better. He needed to do something different. Uh, a number of our students have come from the streets. 90% of them have spent time homeless on the streets. 11 of our students have been homeless for over five years. They had disconnected from society. They had burned every bridge that they had. No one was go going to be able to connect. They didn't have money to go to a program. They didn't have money to go to some treatment facility. But the great thing is the Other Side Academy exists you don't need money to go to the Other Side Academy. You don't need insurance or a government referral or a rich mommy and daddy. We currently, this was at the end of the year, we had 73, we have close to 80 students now. Men and women, they come in. We live in this house, it's called the Armstrong Mansion in Salt Lake City and several of the buildings, we'll show you some of those that we have. At the end of 2017, we had had six students graduate. We, we opened uh, two years before in October, so we had had six reach that two-year mark. Two, uh, three of them were elected to do, just like Mo had elected to stay longer, have, saying, I want to stay longer. I want to help give back. I want to get a little more ready before I go back into society. Two of them are helping us launch some employee-owned businesses that will be run by graduates of the Other Side Academy. One's out. Uh, working in a, as a welder, working for a company and is doing great. This uh, step right here is, is kind of important because a lot of times when students come and they graduate, they've had some baggage with the judicial system. Even They've had some records and they can't work in certain places. So to graduate from the Other Side Academy and then have an opportunity to go into and start an enterprise with us is big. You want to talk about being a peer-run community? Oh, yeah. So um, being a peer-run com community means that all of our students are involved in, in what we do. When you get there, you have a person that's going to uh, help you out for the next couple of days, show you what the schedule is like, and then you're assigned to a tribe, and you have a tribe aid. All right? So a lot of the times, if you're going through something, uh, rather than a person confronting you right there on the spot, they'll go to your tribe leader and say, hey, you know what? I think Tim's is struggling with this. I think he might be struggling with that. And so we're constantly looking out for each other. And your radar has to be on. You have to be looking at facial expressions. You we don't want anybody to fall by the wayside. We don't want to miss anybody that's going through anything emotionally. So everybody's involved with the entire house. And why is it important that there 
there's no doctors or therapists, but people like you who've figured out how to make it through this. I've been in a lot of programs and, and, and graduated from some programs. And while I was in those programs, I wrote about my emotions and, you know, wrote letters of apology to family members and all those folks that, that did wrong. And you know what? I ended up feeling worse. I ended up feeling worse. When they come and they try to run some story about they're feeling this way or they want to leave because they missed their girlfriend or uh, they missed their boyfriend or whatever, I've been in those situations and I can tell them exactly what's going on. I'll listen for a minute and I'll tell them, this is what's going on. This is hard. Your MO is to give up every time it gets rough. And that's what's going on right now. Doesn't have anything to do with your sister, your brother, or your child. Because before you got here, you were in the streets. You maybe saw your child once a month. So when they try to run that story on us, we've already been there. And we have the appropriate response. As students get there, at first they come in and uh, they're getting used to the routine. They're getting up early. They're working hard all day long. For many of them, especially if they've come, been homeless, this is a new experience to follow a structured, scheduled life where they're getting showered, they're dressing appropriately, they're getting up, they're working hard all day. They go to take a break, they come back from break. They go to lunch, they come back from lunch and they do it again the next day. For many of our students, uh, this is a, uh, uh, they've never been trusted with anything, or at least for a long time. But someone who's been there for a few weeks might be given the opportunity to say, hey, I want you to take this new student under your wing and help them out, be aware of them. Be, and for the first time, they're given a responsibility to care for someone else. And you see something happen to them when they're entrusted with those responsibilities. They say, wow, I do need to watch out for him. I do need to be paying attention to someone besides myself. And slowly you see this inward focus turn outward and they start caring about other people. And, they, and so then we can give them more responsibilities. They can become crew bosses. They can become tribe leaders. They can become head of, and some of our students are helping run million dollar companies. So that, you, that photo that we just saw right there, you saw him holding up the watch. And that's kind of significant because he's done such a great job. Soon as he arrived, he bought into what we were asking him to do. We said, do this, do this, if you want to get better. He's done everything we asked him to do. So when a student gets to that point like that, we have a job change. That person is in charge of all the new people in the house. And that person has a watch. So we've just changed over, and he's the now the new crew boss over all the freshmen in the house. And that's why he's holding the watch up. And look at his satisfaction. I get to watch and help these people. It's something beautiful to see. So this is uh, property, the Armstrong Mansion is this building right here. Um, this, uh, we house about 30 people, uh, men living there. We then have the building right next to it. Um, we call Annie's Cottage, this is where the women are living. Uh, we're leasing this and we have more men living there. And um, this top house, these were two abandoned buildings, uh, homeless were living them, drug paraphernalia, they're horrendous inside. We're cleaning up the top one and that's going to be our new dining hall and a meeting space. This bottom one, we couldn't figure out how to save and we finally, just yesterday, got news that the Salt Lake City is going to let us tear it down so we can, we can expand our population in Salt Lake City. And we're really excited about that. So how do we support, if we don't take government money, if we don't, if we don't take insurance money, if we don't charge the students anything, how do we support it? We run social enterprises within the, the nonprofit. And we're here to tell you that we're going to be this year a profitable nonprofit. And we're really excited about that. Our, for our, most of our revenue comes from our moving company. We, We've heard testimonial today about how great they are. You want to talk about the moving company here, Mo? Yeah, so we started off with uh, one truck. Well, actually, before we, we got the one, the one truck, uh, 
our managing director and uh, a couple of staff members were here first. And what we used to do first is we would go and rent a U-Haul to do a move for a day. And all the staff was, would, would help out. And then we started rolling. We would go rent two moving trucks for two days. Now we're on a roll now. Then we graduate from that to one truck. And we're doing daily moves. Go ahead. So we now have six months, and we're doing over 100 moves a month. And we are the top rated moving company in Salt Lake City. I want you to think about this moving company run by guys who are used to be really good at taking your valuables out of your house. Not through now, the front door. They weren't going through the front door. We're really good at that, apparently. We know how to pack up your valuables and get them out, out of your house really quick. <laughs> and uh, c coming to Salt Lake City and starting a moving company when there's so many other moving companies, and for us to, like, in a short amount of time, dominate that industry is pretty incredible. Go ahead. Look on Yelp. Look on Thumbtack in Salt Lake City and search for the highest rated moving company. You'll find that the Other Side Academy shows up as number one, run by former addicts and convicts who on average have been arrested 25 times. How do you do that? How do you get that? It's by this intense level of accountability. So when we're carrying a couch up, up the stairs and come around the corner and we nick the wall, guess what happens? The person who nicked it will go over and say, sir, I want to let you know we just nicked your wall. How would you like us to take care of it? We can come back and patch it. You can hire someone and we'll pay for it. But we made that mistake and we're going to own, own it and we want to take care of you. That's unheard of in these type of companies. And people just rave about it. Our students also don't have cell phones. So they're not, every time they drop a box, they're not texting, they're not Snapchatting, they're not doing anything. They're working, they're hustling. We had one student, one student tell us that they talked, uh, one of the clients said, I can't believe how hard you're working. Why are you doing this? He says, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it so the next guy can come in off the street and have an opportunity like I had. That's why I'm working so hard. And we're being financially successful. In our second year of operation, we grew by 300%. We generated $1.26 million in revenue. And we're going to continue that growth this year. Go ahead. This Mark. is a food truck that we have also. And uh, there's Randy, that's, that's one of our uh, graduates. Uh, right now, and there's a company, a construction company in the community uh, that supports what we do. They had some family members, some cousin or Uncle Bob or, or whatever that was using drugs or alcohol, so they knew uh, the struggle. And they said, hey, you know what? We got a couple spots that when you have some graduates, we'll open them up to you. And so that's the food truck that she was working on while she was here. The food truck, it wasn't up and running. When I got hired, moved from Las Vegas, to Salt Lake City, a managing director Dave said, hey, take that food truck and do something with me, with it. And I was like, what, is this a gang initiation or something? <laughs> it's snowing, and I'm out here. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, that's, that's my favorite word. Okay, so we got the food truck running, and we started getting uh, jobs, and it, it just got to a point where it, people were just calling and ringing our phone off the hook um, on this uh, uh, food truck. It, it was an opportunity for uh, people to practice their customer service skills, you know, people to, for people to be honest. And, and, and when we're out on the food truck, we let our students know. If any family members or girlfriends or boyfriends show up, you need to let us know. And every single time they come, hey, Mo, those are my parents. Hey, Mo, that's my ex-girlfriend. Practicing being honest. And that's important because sometimes they were getting high with their parents or with their girlfriend. So we need to keep our students safe. So they need to let us know who it is they're interacting with. But it isn't, you need to understand, it isn't that our student just learns how to make a really incredible gourmet funnel cake. <laughs> our, 
our students are learning how to work and how to stay employed. They're learning how to deal with those frustrations that come out by working alongside in a, a small, cramped, hot, you know, food truck and get, you know, bumping elbows with someone else and, and having the frustration and the pressure of a, delivering superior customer service. They have to learn how to deal with those challenges. That's the underlying behaviors. Because before, as Mo said, the, the instinct is to run or to fight or to hide and to separate yourself from the problems. And part of the process is helping them learn how to face their problems, deal with it, and do it again the next day. Now this is Mo's baby, so I'll let you tell all about the Thrift Boutique. Uh, the other side Thrift Boutique. We had this 33,000 square foot, uh, you know, it was a former uh, furniture store with 33,000 square foot. Um, warehouse, it was a mess. We tore up the floors, we tore down everything inside and outside, and this was all done by the students. Students done all the work. Um, so when we first started off, we knew that it would depend on the, the, the amount and the quality of, of furniture and, and, and donations that we would uh, be getting. And we just had an outpouring uh, from the community. We had all high-end products coming to the store and we're wondering, man, can we sustain this, uh, this flow of uh, donations? And that's exactly what we did. We built uh, the garden, uh, the landscaping and, and everything outside. Our students do all the, uh, the, the, the marketing. Uh, they do all the window display at Christmas time. We had such an awesome Christmas display. People were stopping by and, and taking pictures and wanting to buy our displays that we had um, in our window. And uh, as you can see, we just took off. We, we had a grand opening, and uh, you know the community found out about it, and it's just been busy every day, every day. And again, as you go in there, you'll see, you look at the reviews on Google reviews on on Facebook. You'll see review after review of five star. The service was incredible. The we figured out how to take um, some of these low entry businesses and really stand out, really create a competitive advantage with these businesses and teaching those really important customer service skills. Uh, yeah. If you want to have some real fun, go to Facebook, look on the, the other side, Thrift Boutique, and watch some of the video ads that our students have made up on their own. They're campy, they're goofy, and they're really charming. And, and like we say, our vocational training schools is an opportunity to see some of that um, destructive behavior uh, come out. And so for our women, we have a couple women that work inside our thrift boutique. At a certain point, a woman gets to choose the kind of clothes that she wants to buy, and at a certain uh, a month in their stay, they get to start to put on makeup. And so the staff, we kind of watch that, and we kind of see the behavior change. We kind of see that flirtatious part come out. And we, we challenge them right on the spot. We'll pull the women aside and say, hey, you know what? You're bigger than makeup. You're bigger than your body parts. You're bigger than flirting with men. Act accordingly. Have some respect for yourself. Have some decency. Have some integrity. You don't have to do that. But that vocational training school, there was another opportunity for us to see it. That behavior came out. And we were able to challenge them on it and say, hey, don't go backwards. So many of our women have had problems with setting appropriate boundaries in relationships with, with men. And this is a chance for them to learn how to set those boundaries and say, I'm not going to allow me to be treated that way. I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to send the signals that it's OK to abuse or exploit me. Um, and, and this is a beautiful thing, and it's a, a daily practice and a daily vigilance, and, and they're, they're figuring it out. They also have an opportunity to work in some of our departments that are internal, that help run and support the operation. We, we have people who are helping make food for 100 people, at three meals a day. That's a lot of work to make sure you think about the logistics and the timing and the planning that has to go into providing the food. 
we have people who are helping reach out to the community and corporations to help supply some of the um, some of our expen expenses. So, you know, we got 600 pairs of Levi's from Levi Strauss, so we don't have to buy pants for our our students for a while because. Levi Strauss believed in what we're doing. So we have students who will reach out to different corporations to get the, solicit those in-kind donations. We have, and so they're learning skills across a wide variety, everything from bookkeeping to um, logistics planning to scheduling to management to finance to marketing to social media. Um, they're having these experiences, but again, the most important thing is the underlying, they're learning how to overcome those underlying behaviors. We don't even talk about drugs as part of our program. In fact, you get in trouble if you do talk about your past. It's who are you today and where are you going with your life? Yeah, because a lot of the times um, people want to talk about drugs and alcohol, and that's really not the issue. People that get released from jail and prison, the majority of them have not had any drugs or any alcohol, but will get out and go right back to the same neighborhood, go right back to the same dope house, go b right back to the same toxic behavior. And that's without any drugs or alcohol. So that's why we don't talk about drugs or alcohol. We deal with your destructive behavior. So. Last year, we covered 92% of our operational expenses through the revenue from our vocational training schools. We, we were profitable four out of the 12 months right at the end of the year. So if you look at our curve, we, we crossed that break-even point near the end. We're completely confident that this year will be 100% sustainable. A profitable nonprofit that's not taking any money from taxpayers, that's not taking any money from our students. We're taking care of our, the problem. And that's really a philosophical important part, that our students realize that they're in charge of the solution to fix them, not someone else. Absolutely. So just uh, last year, we started the Thrift Boutique about halfway through the year. We'll run it this year. It should expand, and we should see our, our revenues uh, grow even more than what we did last year. Um, so just a quick impact on our students. Um, here's one of the women. She talked about not having those boundaries, uh, a really powerful statement that that she made using her body as an ATM to, in exchange for drugs. Uh, but today, she's a completely different person. She's someone who has values, who has integrity. And you should, you know, she's one of the most beautiful people that you'll meet that, who now feels like, uh, she says, I feel like I'm me again. It's, it's something beautiful. And you see that with, with uh, you know, with the students that we see. You see this transformation that happens, this redemption in real time that goes on there. You see them re reconnecting with families. For many of them, they had destroyed every relationship in their life. They had disconnected, they had abused, they had stolen from, they had taken, they, um, and their families had finally cut them off. And you see them starting to reestablish with children that they didn't raise or with, um, mom and dad who had given up with them, or grandparents who had raised them. And, and that's something beautiful to see them reconnecting with their families. And a, a wider circle. That's a big one right there. I mean, look, if you look at the, the students that uh, come through the Other Side Academy before they got there, this is what the taxpayers were on the hook with. Right here, $17 million. That's what it costs to incarcerate or jail uh, our students uh, before they got there. But when they get to the other side academy, we put a stop to it. And we projected that um, if the taxpayers were still on the hook with the same amount of students that we have, the increased numbers of students, this is what our taxpayers would be on the hook for. And I think that's something really important for the community to, to look at. We don't charge anything. You come and you sit on our bench. We give you an interview. All you have to do is be honest. First time we hear you lie, that's the end of the interview. So where do we go next? Well, we want to grow. We just got permission to tear this down. We need more housing. This is an apartment building right across the street, and we currently have it under contract. 
and um, it's going to cost us $2.4 million. We've been able to secure a loan for $1.4 million, and then we're in the process of raising another million to help us buy it. But guess who's going to pay the loan back? It's going to be the students who are part of the program. They are going, they're paying two-thirds of the price of this building. The students are. Not some outside entity, not some, you know, rich donor, but the students themselves, when they're helping lift that box, they're helping get another hundred people off the streets of, of Salt Lake and out of the jails. This is what the other side academy is. We hope to expand this model to every major metro area across the United States. It's a sustainable model. We can scale it. We have to grow the leadership. But we believe that our only hope to reform the criminal justice um, elements of our society and how we treat them is to adopt a new belief in the richness of human capacity. I believe that all of us have the capacity to undergo transformational behavioral change. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how far that scale is down. You can start to balance that scale by, by go, undergoing this change and starting to give back like Mo has done. Today we still have jails and prisons and homeless shelters overflowing with people who have hit rock bottom and don't know how to change. It doesn't have to be this way. Absolutely. And just like that friend that went up to Mo, and what did he say? Shook, Shook you by, you the, by shoulders? the shoulders? Hey, you're better than this. You need to get some help. So now we're doing the same thing with people that come to the Other Side Academy for help. It's a we, great model and it works. Mo worked for the King Center in Atlanta mm -hmm. with Coretta Scott King. Martin Luther King said, said this, we may have been silent in the past because we didn't know how to help. We don't have to be silent anymore. There is a model that it worked for Mo. It's worked for tens of thousands of others. And today that model is here in Utah and we hope to expand it across the country. There is a model to bring about these transformational behavioral change so that these lost souls can live lives of integrity, fulfillment, and love, just like Mo Absolutely. is doing. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, we'd like to leave, uh, make it available for some questions and you let us know when we need to wrap it up. Do we have any questions? Yes, here in the back. So I love the focus that you put on relationships and how those play into our overcoming our challenges and our difficulties. And I wanted to ask, uh, you said that we have to be, if you're the one struggling, you have to have the decision in your heart that you have to change. That's where it really comes from. But I also want to know what you have learned from your experience of wh what role you as the assistant or as the other half in that relationship play in helping that person get out of the hole that they're in? Well, I, I can tell you from experience and, and, and everybody that I've, I've interviewed is that um, that significant other or, the, or, or mom or a grandmother or whoever it may be has allowed that person uh, by letting them stay under their roof, giving them money, and not really saying, hey, you know what, with that kind of behavior and that drug use and the people that you're bringing in my house, you can't do that. And time after time, we have parents that actually bring their, their child to the other side academy. And we let them know, hey, you know what, this is not going to work. It has to be your son or child begging and pleading for help. It can't be somebody else wanting you to get better more than you. 
And we see it so many times, the girlfriend or the boyfriend allowing the girlfriend or the boyfriend to use drugs in their house, giving them money, and you know that they're going to go use it for drugs. You know, as hard as it is, you got to cut that person off. You got to cut that person off. And it's hard to do. Because uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of addicts, they get, they're, they're just draining their parents. The parents is giving them and dishing out thousands of dollars, giving them a car, giving them a place to stay. You got to cut it off. Otherwise, it's going to continue. And it's a hard thing to do. And we see parents and boyfriends and wives and husbands struggle with it all the time. You got to cut that person off. You say, hey, you know what? I love you, but I'm going to love you from over here. And here's a place that you can call. It has to be that way. Another question. That, that's a great question. Originally, we didn't want to create our own. We went to Delancey and said, we'd like to help expand the Delancey model and bring your model to Salt Lake. Delancey grew to five different locations. Um, they're, they've been around for over 45 years. In the first 20 years, they grew to five locations, and then they stopped. And they haven't added any new locations, and they're not interested. They're, they're handling all that they can handle. And I th really think a lot of it is their management structure and, and uh, style. So as we came to realization that they're not going to expand and bring a Delancey to Utah, we had to come to that decision and saying, we think this needs to be here. And can we build it so we can scale and we can take it to other locations? And we've added and changed some things to the Delancey model that we think it, we believe is an improvement to what they've, the great work that they've done. Yeah, so you can always improve. Uh, like your, your question was, you know, there's some other people or uh, somebody else is doing it. You don't want to shy away from it. You can look at it and say, hey, how can we improve on it? And that's exactly what we did at the Other Side Academy. I remember being at the, uh, Delancey Street, and once you graduated, you got all your belongings, and you took it to the front desk, and you waited for either a family member or a loved one or a ride to come pick you up. And then that was it, right? And then you had to struggle. And, and what I've seen a lot of uh, 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 graduates struggle with is their housing situation. In San Francisco, housing is terrible. And the best that a graduate was getting is a crack hotel or a subsidized hotel. You just graduated, and now you're coming out of your door, and you're stepping over dope fiends and needles and drugs and people knocking on your door asking, do you have a lighter? Do you want a trick? <coughs> we have housing for our graduates at the Other Side Academy. We have housing set up, and that's something that we've done better than uh, Delancey Street. A person that's maybe had uh, some bankruptcies, or you've been evicted, or you've been kicked out of so many apartment complexes, and you go to apply, and the best that you can get is one of those little cheesy hotels that you rent by the hour or weekly. And we all would know, you know, would exist in those kind of places. So, we have a question here. Absolutely, thank you. To change um, things around and make the world a better place, mm -hmm. you know, to do something different with your life. I, I really admire that. Yeah. Uh, my question is more for Tim, though. Um, would you address a little bit, like, there's a lot of good causes out there. There's a lot of good things you can devote your life to. Is there something that, you know, happened in your life that, that made you, like, feel this was, this was it for you? This is what you wanted to do? Uh, there's kind of a kind of a macro answer and a micro answer to that question. Um, I love the intersection of business, of taking the forces of the market and addressing 
uh, a social ill. And, and I've spent my career as an entrepreneur and being able to use those skills as an entrepreneur into trying to change the world is really exciting. And I love that intersection and this had this opportunity. On a, a more personal level, I had a nephew who committed suicide as a result of a drug overdose. I worked as a, you know, in our, our congregation with people who were just constantly going in and out of jail. And I didn't find any solutions to help them with. They'd go to a 30-day program, they'd come out again, they'd go to a 60-day, same as my nephew had. And when I was talking with Joseph Grenny, who will be here in, in a few weeks um, to talk as well, who's our chairman, and we had worked together on some other projects when he said, I'm, I'm getting ready to launch this. Would you like, be interested in helping me out? It, it was the right thing to do. Yes. Yeah, so my question is, like, given, like, the nature of what your nonprofit is to help change people's lives, and at some point that seems to be a breaking point for them that they may not want to go on, so how do you, how do you keep them motivated past that breaking point to see them continue to progress to become better? Well, uh, when you first get there, um, and we interview you, you sit down on the bench, we interview you, and we accept you, you get started right then and there. It's no, I'm gonna, can I go out and smoke a cigarette? Can I go talk to baby mama? No. You start right then and there, and we keep you busy right away. Um, when you first get there, you're a freshman status, and you're helping around with the house. Landscaping, cooking, cleaning up the house and the outside, whatever it is that needs done. We keep you busy all day. You start at 6.30. You come in for breakfast. At 7.30, we have a morning meeting every morning with a morning entertainment. And we have the groups that are broken down into tribes. And one morning, one tribe will have the morning entertainment and the morning you'll do it. So we keep you busy. 7.30, that happens. You're gone the rest of the day. We'll stop at uh, noon and we'll have a uh, seminar. And it could be uh, the word of the day. It could be... Um, you know, whatever's going on in the news, and we talk about that for an hour, and then you're back to work. And you get a break at two, and then you're back at work. And then you get a break right before dinner time, for about 45 minutes to an hour, and you come down and you serve dinner to the rest of the house. And then three, four nights a week, we have uh, different speakers come by. We have what we call, um, it's like a TED Talk, but it's our, ver our version of a TED Talk, it's called a Toasted Talk. And every Wednesday we have members of the, uh, the community uh, it may be an athlete. It may be a uh, political had, figure. We've had Mike come. We've had Mike come and speak. And then we have classes as well. So we keep that person busy. And that's another reason why we don't let people talk about the past. Because once you start talking about the past, you get into this emotional funk. You get uh, depressed and you start feeling down emotionally. No talking about the past. And we're constantly checking on that person. We're looking at their... Uh, their facial expressions, we're looking at their demeanor, we're looking at their conversations. Okay, well, one more question, there's one over here, and someone have? Yes, right here. None. Um, after 30 days, you can call whoever it is that raised you, whether it be your grandma or uncle, or your parents, you can call them. If you have kids, you're not gonna have contact with your kids at least until 18 months. And the reason why we do that is that uh, some people wanna make an excuse, and we've been there and we see it. Oh, I miss my kids. I miss my wife. Well, before you got here, you were in the streets, and you maybe saw your wife or your kid or your family member maybe once a month. Oh, I love my kid, I love my kid. And we confront them. We get real colorful and let them know about themselves. Oh, I love my kid. I love my mom, dad, or whoever. And we ask them, okay, you love your kid? Did your kid come to prison and visit you in prison? You actually allowed your kid to come to prison to visit you? What part of love is that? And there's many examples like that that we give. What you need to do is work on your life right now. 
that kid, that wife, that husband, boyfriend or girlfriend is better off without you right now. And that's the way we deliver it. You need to get your life together. We don't want you to start seeing your kids and then once again, you're in and out of their life. But come 18 months, if you've bought into what we do and you're progressing, you can participate in Kids Day. And that's once a month on a Sunday. You can start that process again. And it's gradual. Because we don't want you in and out of their life, back and forth. You know, someone who is a parent, this was one of the hardest aspects of this model, is saying, you know, how can a parent be separated from their kids? And, and but then as I got more and more immersed into it, I realized that this student who's been to jail 25 times, each time he'll come home and tell his kid, this time's different. This time, I'm going to do right. I'm going, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. And then a few nights later, dad's gone. Mom's gone. They're on the streets. They're being thrown maybe in horrific situations, the kids. Maybe being taken care of by someone else who does have some sense of love and responsibility. We'll ask the student, if you're treating your kid like that, how would you treat them if you hated them? Mm. They need to learn how to make and keep promises before we want them to reconnect with their significant other, before they connect with their kids. So when they get reconnect with their children, this time they're never leaving them again, and they're never going to break their promise, and they're going to treat them the, the way they need to. We appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, you can check us out on the web, The Other Side Academy. We've got some great videos there. If you know of anyone who's lost, whose life is caught in a destructive or cy toxic cycle, invite them to look at the videos. Invite them to come check it out. And if they want to, they can come to Salt Lake, sit on the bench, and, and try to change their lives. Thank you very much.